The increasingly murderous, self-pitying, and delusional Saul is still in hot pursuit of David in chapters 22 and 23 of 1 Samuel. Yet despite betrayals and dire circumstances, David remains a step ahead of Saul and even finds himself gaining a strong following. We come to a point in our reading that we find King Saul had determined that the priesthood, those that are set apart to serve God, were to be exterminated. The news of David's um, arrival in Judah, you know, it reached Saul. And the Bible says, at the time, the king was sitting beneath the tamarisk tree on the hill of Gibeah, holding his spear and surrounded by his officers. Listen here, you men of Benjamin. Saul shouted to his officers when he heard the news. Has the son of Jesse promised every one of you fields and vineyards? Has he promised to make you all generals and captains in his army? Is that why you've conspired against me? For not one of you told me when my own son made a solemn pact with the son of Jesse. You're not even sorry for me. Think of it, my own son, encouraging him to kill me as he is trying to do this very day. Then Doeg, the Edomite, who was standing there with Saul's men, spoke up. When I was at Nob, he said, I saw the son of Jesse talking to the priest, Ahimelech. Ahimelech consulted the Lord for him. Then he gave him food and the sword. King Saul immediately sent for Ahimelech and all his family, who served as priest at Nob. When they arrived, Saul shouted at him, Listen to me, you son of Ahutub. What is it, my king? Ahimelech asked. Why have you and the son of Jesse conspired against me? Saul demanded. Why did you give him food and a sword? Why have you consulted God for him? Why have you encouraged him to kill me as he is trying to do this very day? But sir, Ahimelech replied, is anyone among all your servants as faithful as David, your son-in-law? Why, he is captain of your bodyguard and a highly honored member of your household. This was certainly not the first time I had consulted God for him. May the king not accuse me and my family in this matter, for I knew nothing at all of any plot against you. You will surely die, Ahimelech, along with your entire family, the king shouted. And he ordered his bodyguards, kill these priests of the Lord, for they are allies and conspirators with David. They knew he was running away from me, but they didn't tell me. But Saul's men refused to kill the Lord's priests. Then the king said to Doeg, you do it. So Doeg the Edomite turned on them and killed them that day. Eighty-five priests in all, still wearing their priestly garments. Then he went to Nob, the town of the priests, and killed the priests' families, men and women, children and babies, and all the cattle, donkeys, sheep and goats. By Saul killing the priests, this means that the word of God, as well as all the observances for a cleansing and atonement, would no longer be available there for Israel. Saul was really attacking the Lord. Can you believe that? The audacity he would have to attack the Lord? King Saul, he represents everything that humans desire and God hates in a government leader. King Saul was real, and we read about, everything we read about him is true, you know, but he's also a type and shadow. And he established a pattern for the Antichrist who is about to appear in our present era. King Saul was among the most beautiful of men, the Bible tells us. He was a head and shoulder above, taller, you know, than the other men in Israel. Handsome, strong, charismatic, with a natural bent, you know, for knowing how to manipulate and control. He quickly um, abandoned the ways of his creator for the ways of human evil inclination, which is, spiritually speaking, the dark side. You know, but Saul's behavior and decisions, they were no different than the behavior and decisions of the neighboring nations and governments. But as soon as David arrived on the scene, Saul knew that his reign was threatened. And so his true nature was exposed. And this is generally what we read about in the coming Antichrist who will rise, the Bible tells us, to international prominence and receive the adulation of the world. And apparently even the greatest portion of the institutional church. You know, the Bible tells us 
that there'll be a great falling away. You know, all having been deceived because they have gone so long without the light of God's truth being taught to them, the true word of God. And the rhetorical question is a timeless one. How is it that Satan, whose scriptures tell us at one time lived in heaven in close proximity to God and as the most beautiful and intelligent of all heavenly creatures, could not only rebel against his master and creator, but also honestly believe that he could defeat God? How could Satan not understand you know, to his co that to his core because of his choice to try and place himself on God's throne? that the only possible ending for him would be eternal destruction. Well, we see the same scenario being played out in 1 Samuel as King Saul is fully aware that God has not only removed the throne of Israel from him, but has also completely and permanently abandoned him. You know, did Saul honestly believe that he could defeat God, uh, God's will and hang on to his earthly throne? Did Saul seriously think that he could kill God's anointed one, David, in order to keep David from assuming his God-ordained destiny as king over God's kingdom? The problem with Satan and the problem with Saul and the problem with all leaders of government who think they can supplant God's justice and truth and morality with their own is a deep-seated spiritual irrationality. For the world... These human leaders, they seem to be nearly infallible and undefeatable, you know, men to be followed without question, maybe, if not outright worshipped by some. But perhaps that's why such an extensive account of Saul's life and reign have been preserved for us in the Bible, so we can know what signs to look for and how to prepare when that coming evil world leader springs onto the scene. You know, just as King Saul decided that to eradicate opposition, he had to eradicate the priesthood, so will the Antichrist decide to eradicate opposition. He must eradicate the priesthood of believers. But remember this, God is greater, and his plans are supreme and have been established from the foundation of the earth, and every word of God will prove true. We have already overcome in Christ. And so we set our hope today regardless of what we know is to come, because God in his infinite wisdom and goodness has revealed things to come to us. He is the ancient of days, revealing things that are yet to come, he tells us. He's told us what to expect, but he's also told us what to expect in the end, that the saints truly do overcome, and to him who endures, they will be given a crown of life, and so, and eternal life with the king, and, and in our heavenly home, which is truly our home. This world is fading. And so we need to continue to set our heart, our affections, um, spend our time in God's word and set our heart on his kingdom and his purposes. So in the mighty name of Jesus, I pray you are blessed this day. Shalom.